Recently on this channel, we talked about Curtis Jackson and his dive into video games with the janky masterpiece, Bulletproof. And in that video, I mentioned that it sold incredibly well and of course inspired a sequel. Well, here it is. 50 Cent Blood on the Sand was released in 2009 on the Xbox 360 and the PS3. As stated, it is a follow-up to 50 Cent's Bulletproof from 2005. It's a third-person shooter similar to the prior game, however, unlike Bulletproof's combat relation to games like Max Payne, The Punisher, and 25 to Life, Blood on the Sand puts a heavier emphasis on cover-based shooting that was popular towards the end of the seventh generation of gaming. Following popular titles like Gears of War 1 and 2, Rainbow Six Vegas, and and plenty others. The name Blood on the Sand is, according to 50, also a little nod to his Fat Joe Diss mixtape titled Elephant in the Sand, with some Fat Joe diss tracks even making it into the game. The main two differences between the two games has to be first and foremost the lack of Eminem and Dr. Dre. That is just criminal. And two, being the actual quality of the games. While I loved Bulletproof and I had a great time with it, it was a janky ass game. Blood on the Sand is way more polished and dare I say, actually a good shooter and a great game all around. And it's got some of the most quotable lines in video game history. That bitch has got my skull and I want it back. I need weapons. But today, let's take some time to talk about it in all its glory with 50 Cent and his surprisingly fantastic third person shooter, Blood on the Sand. You still owe me. If I don't get that skull, I'm gonna collect from you personally. With interest, you understand? Blood on the Sand was developed by Swordfish Studios, a relatively unknown British game developer responsible for a couple very British sports games like rugby and cricket, and a third person shooter called Cold Winter that came out the same year as 50 Cent Bulletproof in 2005. That same year, Swordfish was acquired by Vivendi Universal, and that's also the same year that Vivendi Universal became fully under the label of Sierra Entertainment. In 2007, Swordfish was working on a game based on Covert One, a series of books with a top secret government agency battling corruption, conspiracy, and bioweaponry written by Robert Ludlum most known as the creator of Jason Bourne. Covert One's game was going to be released in tandem with a TV series adaptation of the books. However, both the TV series and the game were scrapped for unknown reasons. Since there was already some work put in on Covert One with mechanics of a third person shooter, with an emphasis on using a cover system in place, with character movements, aiming, and shooting all being established, and of course the setting of the Middle East that was made with a Covert Ops group in mind, they had to find a way to put all these assets to use and Vivendi thought that they could adapt the work Swordfish has done and bring it over into a follow-up game to Bulletproof because nothing says Middle East gunfighting like everything else was made from the ground up. They were originally going for a darker tone with Covert One but they lightened up the mood when they repurposed the game to 50 Cent. From the moment they decided to repurpose the game to a 50 Cent action-packed adventure, they had him and the rest of G-Unit in the studio giving feedback every step of the way. They presented the assets they had and how they intended on the story to play out. He's over there doing a show and his payment gets all fucked up due to the local warlord and it's actually 50 Cent himself who wanted to add the idea of a makeshift payment being a priceless diamond encrusted human skull, basing the idea off of the Damien Hirst sculpture made in 2007. It was also 50 Cent who wanted to add some of the vehicle missions. The original game didn't have any code built or allowed for vehicles, so the team had to make assets and new AI that allowed for vehicular combat and shooting while driving. The missions actually turned out pretty well especially with co-op playing in mind, allowing player 2 to control the gun while player 1 drives, and slamming into an adjacent Humvee caused a burnout style crash and explosion. And of course, one of the best moments in the entire game. Yo 50 jump over that big ass rim! As for the final review test of the game, 50 Cent wanted his son to be the one to play test it and make sure that it's good. His son, who was 6 or 7 at the time, I mean I guess if your dad is the main character, the mature rating doesn't really count, right? Either way, he loved the game. But before he left, he said he wanted to see a mission with helicopters in it, another thing that the team had no code or any assets for. But as 50 Cent left the studio, he said, you heard him, make a level with helicopters in it. So they did, and I feel like they went overboard just in case he came back and wanted more. There's like three helicopter boss fights and a level where you fly around controlling a minigun out of the side of one. 
This wasn't just a simple repurposed game pooped out into existence with 50 Cent's likeness slapped on the cover. While the idea to use 50 again in a third person shooter was motivated by the incredible sales of the first game, there was an incredible amount of effort and passion put into making this game work. It wasn't the smoothest start. Initially, Swordfish was culture shocked by the whole idea. Production director Ian Flat stated, When we first heard, our jaws were on the floor. It was bizarre. We were an all Caucasian group of brothers. Rummies. We never thought we'd be picked to do something like this. It was a complicated idea to grasp for the team. Taking what was once a game about international espionage and molding that into something with a gangster rap aesthetic. It was also a battle to finalize the location for the game when it came down to it. It's not like they could go into any Middle Eastern market square and location to scout. The team ended up taking a lot of inspiration from movies at the time like Black Hawk Down and Traffic as well as using their home base in Birmingham, incorporating spaces like the local shopping mall and the Alexandra Theater into the game. This game almost was lost to corporate takeovers. While the game was completed in 2008, the publisher Vivendi merged with Activision, and at the same time Activision was in a merger with Blizzard. And during these moves, Activision acquired the company, but decided not to take over several of the games that they had in the works, 50 Cent being included. Also at the same time, Swordfish was in the works with Codemasters in hopes of becoming a development house under their brand, which they did eventually, but Blood in the Sand was the only holdup as Codemasters was not interested in that title either. After several months in limbo, THQ eventually picked up the title in 2009 and released the game, and Swordfish completed their transformation into Codemasters Birmingham. As far as how they felt about the game after release, they were very proud of what they did. They have tremendous pride in their name, and they wanted to make the best shooter with cover mechanics that they could. It was an odd project to the point of being ridiculous, but that didn't mean we didn't want it to be good. We knew that people would be interested straight away because 50 Cent was on the box, but we still wanted a solid shooter with good cover mechanics. You could have put any character in there and it would have stood up. I suppose if King Kardashian ever wanted to do a shooter, we could sort that out. I'll be right back. <laughs> Can I get you anything? A gun. With that being said, how did the game play out? Fucking amazing. The game is 90% boots on the ground blasting your way through Middle Eastern marketplaces, residential areas, and shopping centers. It feels really good to play. I booted this thing up on a PS3 emulator and it just felt super solid to play. The animations and controls were crisp, popping in and out of cover, line firing from cover, tossing grenades, it all just felt really well done. And this is clearly a game made for co-op play as well. I really wish that I had an Xbox copy so I could have done some co-op stuff. The whole time you're running around as 50, you have a member of G-Unit at your side that you can choose from the start. It's all the same cast as the crew from Bulletproof, with the exception of Young Buck, since him and 50 Cent had a falling out. But at every turn, it's heavily focused on co-op gameplay. It takes both characters to boost each other up on high walls, and to open heavy doors, and the driving missions are almost too hard on single player, because you're relying on the AI of Lloyd Banks or whoever to shoot the vehicles before they shoot at you. You just control the H2 as player 1. The helicopter missions as well has both players on the turrets shooting waves and waves of enemies. You can definitely tell that this was designed for two active shooters aiming at these targets, rather than just you and some questionable AI. But single player is still a ton of fun. The weapon variety was fantastic as well. While maybe not as diverse as Dr. Dre's van of guns in the first game, the tiered levels of weapons in Blood on the Sand have a very noticeable difference in performance. The starting AK and M16 pack a punch, but as enemies get more resilient later on, you need the upgraded guns like the 100 round LMG or the RPG. You can purchase guns through pay phones located throughout the levels, which I didn't realize till later on that they also stock your ammunition when you just pick up the phone. A lot of the time I knew I didn't have the money to buy the new fancy shotgun or something, so I wouldn't even pick up the phone, and meanwhile I'm out of grenades and SMG ammo. But that's also one of the big improvements that this game had over Bulletproof. The weapon inventory system was miles ahead. In Bulletproof, you'd have to scroll through your weapons on an infinite loop in one direction to pick the right gun. And if you accidentally go past it, you have to scroll all the way back around to get through it. In Blood on the Sand, the weapons are grouped into four categories. Pistols, rifles, shotguns and SMGs, and then rocket launchers and snipers. Each category having several guns to choose from that you can buy at payphones or pick up from dead ends. 
enemies. While in the payphone menu, you can also purchase executions. Similar to Bulletproof, you can use instant kill executions, however, this game requires some quick time button input to complete them, similar to the interactive executions from Manhunt 2. Although these are super simple, usually just hitting the square button in the right timing sequence. It doesn't mean I didn't fuck it up a bunch though. Up there in the window! Motherfucker! Game over! Another thing that you can spend your hard earned cash on is some taunts. Yep, in this game you can spend money to call someone a bitch before you kill them with a dedicated swear button on the controller. And it's not even just a gimmick. Taunting an enemy before killing them nets you some bonus points, resulting in more money and achievements. Such an iconic concept, to earn points calling dudes a bitch in a shootout. Oh you fucked up now bitch! One of the biggest things they added to this game that was something pretty common in shooters at this point in time was a bullet time mechanic called Gangster Mode, where time slows and you can precisely pick off enemies in a glorious way. This reminds me of Max Payne 3, and not just for the obvious reasons of bullet time, but also with the whole attitude of the game and the aesthetic of the enemies and the environment, I just kind of feel like this game was an inspiration to Max Payne 3, even though I know it most likely wasn't. Challenges are also present in the levels since this game is sort of set up like an arcade shooter. Like I said about the taunting granting you more points, points go towards giving you medals at the end of the level. Bronze, silver, and gold, like a lot of games in the mid 2000s. Challenges are the best way to rack up points. You'll get pop up challenges like loot X amount of dollars in 30 seconds or kill X amount of enemies in 10 seconds. Rapid fire things that are possible but honestly they're pretty challenging if I do say so myself. Points can also be earned by collecting 50 cent and G unit posters throughout the levels, shooting hidden targets scattered about, and of course comboing your kills one after another for a multiplier. Getting a higher score at the end of a level results in unlocking concept art, music videos, and exclusive music tracks for the game, so there is some pretty good incentive to be a completionist here. This ties into probably my only complaint about the game. The screen is too fucking cluttered. You got your points, you got your cash, you got your guns, your health bar, your multiplier, your challenge pop-ups, your crosshairs. Combine that with explosions going on, busting open crates full of gold doubloons, and constant barrages of automatic weapon fire and rocket launchers. It's a busy and stimulating game that is a little bit too much for me. Luckily, the actual fun of the gameplay overshadows it. Oh, and another complaint that I have have is that there's no sprint button. Like, why? There's only one speed. Gangster walk. But overall the game is fucking fantastic. It's not long enough to become repetitive. I beat the game in one sitting in about three hours. It's a breeze to get through and when I was done I immediately wanted to dive in for another go. It does what it does and it does it well. The plot of this game is about what you would imagine it to be, off the simple premise. 50 and G-Unit are doing a tour in an unidentified country in the Middle East, and as their show comes to an end, they go about collecting their payment, a cool $10 million. However, 50's agent calls him to inform him that there's a lack of said $10 million in his bank account, making him and the boys kick in the concert promoter's door and demand payment. The promoter, Anwar, says it was stolen by local gangsters, working for a warlord named Saeed Kamal. And in an effort to save his head from the wrath of 50 Cent's shotgun, he pulls out a priceless human skull encrusted in diamonds. He tells 50 a deep backstory of love and creation of the skull, and philosophical Lloyd Banks responds with, Damn, look at that ice, man. He redeems himself later on, talking about the age of the walls in the area, saying that they're Napoleonic. Now these walls are hundreds of years old. What you know about that? Napoleonic, if I'm correct. <laughs> what? See? Napoleon. <laughs> okay, okay, you got me. You know your shit. Alright? 50 Cent takes the skull and asks for transport out of the city. In the Humvee, 50 and Anwar argue over which city has the worst gangsters, the one that they're in, or 50's hometown of Queens. The argument kind of answers itself when they get ambushed and the poor driver gets slumped. 50 takes control of the truck and up next follows one of the coolest cinematics in video game history. I'm going to play it with the original audio and I hope that it doesn't get copyrighted.
Anyway, moral of the cutscene, 50 Skull gets taken and he spends the next few hours killing dozens if not hundreds of Middle Eastern gangsters to get it back, not taking shit from anyone in the process. Where's your boss, bitch? After you hunt down the initial man responsible for taking the skull and killing him, it turns out that there's a bigger fish in the pond that has the skull now. Some American guy who is corruptly running the whole country. It's like they realized that the game is too short, so they added on some random dude to fluff the story another couple levels. The girl at the beginning, Layla, was originally running with Kamal and is now on 50's side to take down this American dude. That Honestly, I just forgot his name. And it seems she becomes a love interest of sorts to 50 Cent. You crazy bitch, you know that? That's my kind of girl. However, in the end, she betrays 50 and steals the skull out from under his nose, making him chase her down and get the skull back once and for all, leaving her stranded in the desert as 50 and his crew ride out. I'm the one to commit to, girl. Fuck with a pimp, come on, travel the world. 50. 50. I'm sorry, honey. Wait! I didn't mean it. We can start over. You want crazy bitch. What are you doing? You can't just leave me here? Ugly bitch, is it? Let's go home. The plot of this game is honestly just what you want from a game like this. Simple off the wall shit with well done voice acting and really well paced levels. Nothing crazy or sensational, but it's not absolute garbage either. I can't really ask for anything more. Unlike Bulletproof, Blood on the Sand was a commercial failure, selling less than 56,000 copies in the first two months, which is probably why the game is like 80 bucks right now. I tried to get the 360 copy because it's backwards compatible on the Xbox One, and I'm not spending that kind of money on 50 cent, so emulation was the way to go. Even though I had to deal with some gross looking lighting and shader issues when it gets too bright in the game, but even that was more tolerable than spending 80 bucks on a 50 cent game. It is surprising that the game sold so poorly because the game was objectively better in every way, except maybe the lack of Eminem and Dr. Dre. Swordfish, you really fucked up on that one. But it could also be attributed to 50 Cent not being the top dog in hip hop anymore. In 2005, with albums like Get Rich or Die Tryin' and The Massacre selling over 20 million copies worldwide, 50 was at the top of his game and was a household name even in houses that didn't bump gangster rap. Your grandma knew who 50 Cent was, I guarantee it. However, in 2009, with recent albums like Curtis and Before I Self-Destruct combined selling about 4 million copies worldwide, 50 Cent was not the same caliber of artist that he was years prior. There was also some video game competition at the time. Not everyone can buy every game, and what on the surface seems like a gimmicky cash grab may not be high on everyone's list when games like Killzone 2, Halo Wars, Street Fighter 4, The Lost and the Damned, and Fear 2 all released in the same month as 50 Cent Blood on the Sand. All this adding up to, well, about 56,000 copies. The game reviewed fairly well, most critics putting it on the good but not great category, and I think most most of the reason it got knocked in the score was because of its subject matter and protagonist. Across the board, the actual gameplay was praised pretty highly. It's unfortunate because the game was actually a lot of fun, and I think expanding this pseudo G-Unit universe would have continued to be a lot of fun. Oddly enough, 50 Cent is very passionate about it and he enjoys making good games and he puts his all into the voice acting of them, and the fact that it's helping him bond even more with his kid was an added motivator for him. I wish that we saw this game on PC as well, seeing it remastered or modded would be fantastic, and the online co-op would be unreal I think. But for now, this game is stuck in the past, and you can buy the 360 copy and play it on the newer Xboxes that are backwards compatible, and of course you can buy and play it on original hardware. Just be warned, it ain't cheap. With that being said, that is the sad history of Blood on the Sand. It was a game that fought corporation movements and the repurposing of existing assets and animations and was surprisingly fun and entertaining on release, even though it was released and almost immediately forgotten about. It is sort of a cult classic now. It's definitely talked about a lot more on YouTube than Bulletproof was, but I think that's because people are playing it more recently and realizing that it's a dope ass game and it deserves a little recognition. And I'm here adding to that. And if you can, go play it. And if you have played it, hype it up even more. By sharing this video to everyone you know. <laughs> I'd like to take this time to thank all my supporters on Patreon, the Bear Jew himself, D. Schwinn. You got heard about the Bear Jew. 
I heard of the bear too. Kid Kingpin, Doug Smith, Anonymous Starkweather, Sofa Pals Productions, Zachary Parkerson, Crash Bandicoot 25, Potty, and Yay Man. I appreciate all of you. As always, thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time. Peace. I make a movie out of him, I leave him flat on his face with shit oozing out of him, niggas wanna stunt. I know what to do about him, hit me that cat, I make an action bag movie out of him. We bout to ball with the Chris, gorillas in the mist, you motherfuckers try to front, I go bananas with the clips. Got a